Thank you. Okay, we'll open it up uh, broadly now. So a really almost trivial question, though, is, is the Ignite example has been brought up a couple of times, and, and I, I was just having a side conversation with Jeff uh, because I've, I've been under the impression that Ignite is a bunch of different projects, um, all focused on different aspects of a, of a similar problem. So uh, the, the idea of creating you know, common surveys or, uh, is, a, is a really pretty laudable one. So the very specific question is, was that in the budget? Or is that something, was that an unfunded mandate added afterwards? So I'll have to defer to Jeff, would you, can you ask I'm, I'm happy to make a comment, and Erwin and Julie, you should as well. Um, I think, um, uh, so like all the other networks, we, we came to the table with specific projects in mind and began discussions about where the cross-cutting themes would be you know, in a, amongst the projects in the consortium. And uh, now we've arrived, arrived at a fairly sizable number, probably more than we can truly manage. Um, uh, so I haven't answered your question yet, but, but, I, but I think it's implied that um, you know, there's the project funding, there's the uh, working groups that I think um, most, most of us, I think all of us, uh, PIs and, and investigators feel are quite compelling and necessary for the success of the network. Um, I don't think there's a specific line item save that the very, there's a high expectation, as there are in all of these programs, that the coordinating center will, um, you know, uh, re reduce um, the additional burdens and logistics of that as much as possible. But I think um, all of the groups right now, which are the common measures group, that you've mentioned, um, a, a group associate, associated with dissemination and outcomes and economic sustainability, and some emerging groups that are, um, you know, thinking about the scientific focus on pharmacogenetics, the interactions with the payers, as we've discussed, and also what the provider needs um, are for adoption. Those are some of the main themes right now. Um, and I think just another um, just sort of caveat, the Ignite Network is only two years old, which may sound like a long time, but uh, in, in the context of what we're trying to do here, um, uh, it's, it's insufficient to draw significant conclusions at this point. Um, so I may, let me I'll stop there. I, I so think I addressed I mean, part of your question, and maybe Erwin and Julie so the, would like the, to comment. Let me just be, let me let me re let me re ask the question, and that is sort of or not re ask the question. But let me back off from the phrase unfunded mandate because I think that that sort of carries a, a, a tone of criticism that I'm that I don't wish to imply. I think I think you've done a terrific job, and I, and I think maybe one of the recommendations that we can make to NHGRI leadership is that is that when we put efforts like this together. Even if they seem disparate at the beginning, there needs to be some mechanism to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. In Emerge, it's easy because we're all sort of focused on the same kinds of issues. In, in Caesar, it's, 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 um, it's it, I can see how uh, many sites could, could have commonalities. In, in, in Ignite, it was less clear to me. But I think you've managed to show us that it can be done and, and uh, to some value, presumably. So, so I guess that's the sort of unspoken or maybe clear to everybody in this room except me of, of my question. But Erwin, sorry. Erwin. Yeah, no, Dan, that's it's a very good point because I can say from our experience that uh, initially uh, there was sort of some sort of tension between each project being funded and wanting to get uh, their own project out of the gates as quickly as possible and uh, through uh, coordinating center and other uh, interjections there was at the same time a, um, a, a mandate to come up with common measures etc cetera, etc cetera, which made sense but you know wasn't exactly what we had in our proposal and therefore we needed to make up effort to address that and um, I think it is an important aspect. Uh, I think in, 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 in hindsight, if it had been sort of explicitly stated as part of the RFA or something, uh, that would be helpful. And I think going forward, if U01 networks have uh, these kind of mandates, then you know, this is also part of uh, the budgetary con issues, et cetera, et cetera, and should be part of that. Uh, that is a very clear point, uh, I think. Or, or, or the court. Can, I, let's ju let Julie get a shot in here, too, if, if she wants to make a comment. Yeah, so, I mean, I would, ag I would agree with what um, Jeff and Irwin said. I mean, I think that none of us had budget to do some of these things that were asked, especially around these common measures. 
And, and I think everybody wanted to play ball, if you will, because we recognize that as a network, we have to accomplish things as a network. Um, I think we're getting a bit challenged because, as Jeff said, you know, we had some early places where we said we had to start, and now um, the network's really in some ways only one year old or less than one year old because the last three groups joined officially about nine months ago. Um, and, and that's really when I think we begin to, to establish some momentum. And um, so, so I think we're at the point now that we have a lot of opportunities that we see for common work across the groups, but probably not the bandwidth. And so, um, you know, it, it's a challenge of in the budget we have in our individual projects that we have to also be successful in and then thinking about how we prioritize those group efforts. Um, so, I mean, I would agree with Irwin's comment that it might make sense in the future to have and, and probably in the RFA, you say X number of dollars that would be just sort of set aside for common, um, common network-wide projects. And I think some of these challenges for these um, common elements would be less. So uh, I think there's two things that I take away from that. One is, is that um, one can envision, um, even though we have a relatively small um, time exposure, that there are probably uh, outcomes, uh, common outcomes across Ignite uh, that you say, you know, these really make sense where you could bring that to the initial steering committee meeting of eMERGE 3 and say, you guys use these process outcomes unless you can develop you know, a good argument about why you shouldn't use these process outcomes. And I think you could take it the next step, which PCORI has done, which is to say, if you're putting in a pro PCORI proposal, we want to see methodologies that have been developed and vetted by PCORI as part of it, or we want to see something in the project that says, here's where the deficiencies are and we think there's a better way to do it. And I think that that would be something that could be systematically applied to funding opportunities in the space going forward. So Sharon, I think uh, you were next. And, and I, I would just comment from the CSER experience um, where I think the diseases and the ages are more widespread than some of the other uh, consortia, it's actually really important to build this into the RFA. So we have, you know, some groups are being ascertained for hearing loss, we have adults with cancer, we have everything in between. It's actually been a major challenge and to find constant measures. So I would just say that building that into the RFA that say you're including phenotyping is very important. So Jeff had a brief comment and then Mary and then Howard. I'll be brief. I, I, first of all, I thank Mark and everybody for um, highlighting some of the things that Ignite could bring to the table, and I think I speak on behalf of the network in saying we would be honored to have more programs adopt some of the measures uh, and strategies for implementation and share in this um, what we called in our first panel the implementation commons uh, and possibly some of the evidence uh, data uh, databases that have common measures. So that's just a, out there for an HGRI and leadership to, to em, embrace or reject, but I think that, that would be uh, an outcome that we would like to see. Great, Mary. I, I was just going to say, I mean, it does seem to me like for any of these programs, it is helpful to have a coordinating center try to help facilitate some of these efforts, but I would imagine that you need money at the sites in order to generate data that is shareable unless I'm not understanding what you're doing. We had a similar thing imposed on the PGRN, and it was very, very difficult to try to, um, in the Translational Pharmacogenetics Project, get people, after they were years into funding, to generate data in a completely different way than they were set up to do. So I would just imagine, it, it sounds great to me to try to come up with common outcome measures across as many NHGRI programs as possible, but I wouldn't think a coordinating center could handle most of that. Yeah, maybe I should be more clear with in the RFA means money uh, for the, the grants know to put that into their budgets that they're going to have to report those phenotypes. Yeah, so it would be, it'd be similar to the expectation that you build data sharing, uh, data deposition as part of the funding. So that is, this, is absolutely right. I think that is exactly the point, Mary, that, you know, from our experience and we had talked about this, that on the local project side, everything is focused and geared to execute the project, and yet we have all these important conversations about what should be the common measures and then develop these. And even the coordinating center 
coordinates perfectly well, the data and the input still needs to come from the local sites, and I think that's an important consideration. So I'm hearing us in violent agreement on this point. Um, so unless there's strong objection uh, or somebody that says there's a point that's not been brought up relating to the common measures in the RFA, I, and Chris, do you have something that, that's specific to this that's, okay. So uh, after Chris, if there's anybody that, and Terry apparently, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, this, this issue about being in the RFA is important, but I, I would quibble as to the relative influence of coordinating centers. Uh, having been part of PGRN and having been part of Emerge, those experiences were night and day. Uh, and I think what made Emerge more cohesive, uh, particularly in the first round, uh, was when the coordinating center uh, proactively contributed toward the development of shared standards and representation paradigms that made Emerge as a cohesive data resource come together. That never happened in PGRN. Uh, and whether it was the coordinating center or not, or whether it was the intention of the group or not, we could have long and spirited debates. But I do think somebody, it needs to be somebody's day job to worry about how all these pieces within the context of a consortium actually do come together. And unless I, I can be informed otherwise, it would seem that the best way to do that is with an empowered coordinating center. And thank you, uh, Chris, for not bringing up integration of uh, informatics data. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's right. No, no th th this is extraordinarily helpful, and, and we, we really appreciate the, the input and recognizing. I think, Dan, you know, your, your comment about an unfunded mandate, it's probably not totally unfair. Um, you know, I, I think the, if, there, if there were resources put in, into it, they were very limited, and, and they were really, you know, we were focused on the, on the projects as a whole. I, I think the, the, the thing that came up that, that sort of struck me was, you know, we, we're hearing that there are challenges in getting people to work within the networks because you have your own program and you're responsible for the success of that program. And then we're also hearing, wouldn't it be great if you know, all of these programs could interact? And at some point, you know, the bandwidth fails. And, and so w we could use some real help on what's the best way to facilitate interactions. I mean, some of my colleagues sitting behind me do a yeoman's job in bringing together specific working groups. And I think the EHR working group has been quite successful in that. We have a reporting results. We have a couple of others uh, uh, there. But, but you know, there's, there's variable uptake of those. And so do we let that just sort of happen organically? as investigators are interested? Do we, do we try to, you know, put a feeding trough out there and, and get people to, to come to it? So we could use your help on that. Great. And I saw Ken, I think, has a comment also related to this, one of the colleagues behind her. No, it's really more of a, it's a question. Um, as you were covering the informatics and the tools that were being developed, does this group feel that our goal as far as trying to make these tools widely dispersed, widely applicable to multiple and diverse platforms, do you feel that this, that what we are developing and what we're developing in the future will is going to be fulfilled? And what I mean by that is, say, for example, with Emerge, we have algorithms that are designed that are verified by different uh, systems that use different EHR systems. What I'm trying to get at is, do we feel that this group, that the tools that we are developing, would they adequately be developed to cover that kind of diverse platform? And is there an, an, or is there a need to actually try to encourage and endorse development of, plat of tools that actually can cover diverse platforms? That's what I want, that's the only question I wanted to ask. So that, that is, defines a different subject area for me. Um, we'll talk about that next. Uh, so next panel. that'll be next panel, so, so can we put that in the parking lot for the present time? Um, are there any other comments specifically related to um, the uh, point that I think Terry really nicely summed up? Yes. Uh, so, so the only other thing I would um, suggest in the RFA is um, to ask groups in their proposal to think about what are the things that might be those common measures and is a generic term. Um, because I think when a network comes together, at least everybody's thought about it. Um, and you could, hopefully you would begin to see some common ground. Um, and so I think it would get that ball rolling more quickly if that was also part of the RFA. It's not just there, that there's money for these common efforts, but that everybody's put in, you know, a paragraph or two about what are the things that they think would make sense as common measures. 
And maybe I could just share a little bit of uneasiness about um, describing how RFAs should be written. If you can tell us in much broader terms, but, uh, but we, we probably shouldn't have you uh, uh, specifying what might go or might not go in a solicitation, just for more for your protection than anything else, so that you're not in conflict then with the solicitation that comes out with that suggestion. Good. So I'm going to, again, take moderator prerogative here to just say that, you know, the, my experience with these is that, you know, with 55, 60, 70 people in the room, you can infinitely drill down on topics. And so I saw Jonathan's hand up, and, and I guess the question that I would ask to anybody that's thinking to contribute to this is that, is there something that you think is completely novel that we've missed, or is this more of an incremental uh, comment and a refinement that we might be able to pick up? later, because I know Howard has a different subject that he'd like to launch, and I want to make sure that we get a chance to cover the, the, the sphere. So Jonathan, I don't want to shut you down, but... Well, now I don't know how, if I have something novel to say or anything, but um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I would just say that, you know, I think there's a great deal of benefit to the data sharing and having some standardization across the sites, but one of the things that's been really nice about CSER and Insight is that the projects are very diverse. And I think that there's some danger to proscribing too closely exactly what the, the you know, groups have to be studying. And it sort of eliminates some of that you know, creativity that comes out in the grant writing process. So just a little slight right, counter. So a balance with standardization and innovation. OK, great. Um, I wanted to just make sure that your bullet two here is reflected in this discussion, um, which uh, we know so um, developing what, what the common measures of outcomes in the absence of some input from uh, the payer community or the regulatory community would seem like it has an opportunity, uh, a risk of, of failure to achieve the desired goal. So I'm um, not going to say how or, or where, or, uh, but I think uh, as we've talked about through several of these discussions, if there's going to be um, future uh, research uh, um, uh, in this area from NHGRI somehow upfront. Uh, in designing the, um, the, the, the project uh, goals and aspirations, uh, the, the, that community needs to be part. Right. So I'll just again point out that uh, panel nine is going to specifically represent uh, and be focused on the patient perspective. And so I would uh, think that that would be a nice opportunity to discuss this there. Uh, regarding the payers, I think, you know, those of us that have been involved in the payer meetings we've had is that the payers have been extremely difficult to engage, and in particular, even when we bluntly ask them the question about what sort of evidence do you want, um, it's sort of the uh, Potter Stevens saying, well, we'll know it when we see it. Um, they've not been particularly um, valuable. And again, this may be an opportunity where if we think about healthcare system research networks that are, you know, engaged and embedded with payers that they, we might get more substantive answers. So I am going to move on to Howard and a different topic now. Well, not, not that different because Jeff kind of transitioned over to a different aspect of the discussion, and that is around uh, what are the metrics of success. And I think I'd, I'd love to hear some discussion around uh, intermediate endpoints, uh, intermediate metrics. So we're seeing in oncology right now that uh, many of the payers are interested in, is that somatic sequence going to change a medical decision? They don't know how to capture whether that changes for the better or for the worse. But the fact that there was change is a step towards paying for it. And then, you know, at some point in time, we'll look for changes for the better, however those are measured, and at some point in time, look at survival. But e even these intermediate, which are maybe intellectually less interesting, but these, you know, does change actually occur? Those endpoints are often ig uh, ignored by uh, NIH-type funding because they're just not exciting enough. Um, but I think they, they, you know, then it comes back to Jeff's point about the, the, uh, the, the patients, the delivery systems, the payers, often those are the kinds of decisions that are driving their changes. Uh, and you know, their bar is really low in some ways because they don't usually want survival. They're happy for these intermediate endpoints. Yeah, and, and certainly for those of us that write letters of medical necessity, I mean, right. that's the right. question that we're yep. specifically asked to respond to. How is this going to change your management decision? <laughs> it's not show me the evidence that it's, you know, 10 years from now this patient's going to be better off. So, um, so that, I, I think, is a very reasonable point. So others that have comments about um, uh, sort of this intermediate outcome or maybe what might be characterized as a decision space, Erwin. Yeah, I, uh, thank you for uh, starting this conversation, Howard. I think as I reflect on the programs that I'm, I'm witnessing in Ignite and Emerge and uh, how I can optimize our own program at Mount Sinai, it is increasingly clear that the very first intermediate outcome, if, if you will, or intermediate metric 
has to deal with the medical decision maker, the provider, because there's so much to learn about where they are and there's so much to study uh, 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 how can we optimize sort of the comfort level of the provider and decision maker with incorporating genomics and then actually acting, changing a practice as a result of genomic information. And I was uh, intrigued by surveys of our providers in, as part of the IGNITE uh, project where 68%, two-thirds, are enthusiastic about genomic medicine. And this is a survey of uh, almost 300 providers. Whereas less than a third, so around 20 or so, really are comfortable in any way, shape, or form. So there's a tremendous gap. There's enthusiasm, but we still need to learn, and that's, I think, an area that deserves much more study, how to optimize the process of uh, provider adoption of uh, genomic uh, decision support. I think that is an important point I want to stress. And that is, and that is an intermediate outcome in, 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 in my view. You can measure this as, you know, how many CDS were fired and the fraction that was leading to a change in, in, in orders, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of ways you can readily measure that. Thank you. Other comments related to that, uh, Robert? Yeah, I mean, just building on Erwin's comment, I, I think that's a really good point. I, I worry a little bit about this iterative nature of the implementation evidence, evidence implementation. So are you actually saying that the, that the, that the frontline physician's behavior becomes one of the outcomes we study, or are you saying we generate evidence, including penetrance, including penetrance of intermediate phenotypes, to set precedent to set standards that then they can adopt, because I think the second alternative is more true to the way, they may be enthusiastic, but I don't think they're going to adopt rational uh, actions without that first evidence-based uh, uh, ge generation. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not uh, proposing this to be sequential. I think this ought to be a parallel. Iterative. And uh, I think that, you know, the interpretation of, of outcomes uh, in a situation where the delivery was not optimal, was not optimized, is difficult, is, is potentially biased to suboptimal processes. So I think, you know, the knowledge, uh, closing the knowledge gap, the evidence gap, is extremely important, but also optimizing the delivery. And so then, then you can really, uh, with good conscience, look at studies that do both and uh, draw conclusions on outcomes. Uh, Rex and then Sharon. So, so in, the, in, in the context of thinking about research projects going forward, uh, our experience when we tried to roll out the, our pharmacogenomics project in, in eMERGE um, was that we went to them with these really carefully considered CPIC guidelines that had been developed by experts where they thought there was real evidence to say, if you have this variant, you should do the following. And it was very interesting. We were in our, in our group that we rolled it out to was a general internal medicine clinic. And they, at the end of the day, had a, the ability to say, we'll do these ones, but not those ones. And they actually chose to do only a couple of the ones that were approved as uh, CPIC guidelines. And so it occurs to me, and we've been trying to do a little bit of this, but really understanding what the barrier is there and why it is that they thought that what a group of experts in pharmacogenomics thought was good evidence to create a guideline, but yet was inadequate for less uh, deeply trained individuals with expertise in that area, I think would be a really important set of things to better understand. So that might be a good research project to think about going forward. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because then it gets into the uh uh, issue of, uh, uh, you know, evidence versus uh, uh, cultural change, which ultimately we all know that culture eats strategy and evidence for lunch. Uh, Not to mention the role for RVUs. Yeah. Uh, Sharon. Yeah, just very briefly, I, I do think that we have to, we really need better research on physicians. So in an NHGRI LC project that I carried out now a couple of years ago, we were looking at variant interpretation, but in fact, the main discovery out of that project was that most, and this was primary care physicians in the state of Texas, completely unselected, did not know the concept of a familial mutation. 
And so when presented a familial mutation in a cancer patient and asked what test would you order, they overwhelmingly selected full gene sequencing. So it wasn't so much that the variant threw them off, which was our hypothesis. They actually were reasonable about that. They had no clue you could order a $400 test instead of, at the time, a $3,600 test. So I do think we need a lot more such information about what non-specialists in genetics know and what their clinical practice is and guidelines, really clear guidelines. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's a whole, as putting my informatics hat on, there's a whole uh, range of, uh, of implementation questions, which is, you know, a lot of times we default to the idea of its education and all this sort of stuff, whereas ultimately um, the, the, the decision, and this is, a, a, again, a, a studyable hypothesis, is, um, well, what if you just build the process so that it, the clinician doesn't get to choose, that if that familial mutation is there, that's what's ordered and that's the end of it, and no, I, you don't I have agree. to, yeah. you know, then you avoid, um, you know, some of the other issues. Now, again, there, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's, a, that's more of a, a cultural uh, and systematic change approach as opposed to an individual change approach, but there are clearly going to be some instances where you have to do this at the individual provider level. There may be others where systematic approaches would be more effective, and you could study f under what circumstances would one approach versus the other be more, uh, be more efficient. So, Howard, I think I had you next. So I think the other side of this equation is, is also looking at the patient. Um, we know that, as you were just saying, you know, implement. Wait a second, this is we're talking about 21st century medicine, Howard. Exactly. We're, know, we don't look at patients anymore, <laughs> right? But that's the whole point, right? Is that adoption is really a hard part, and what we've learned is direct to consumer advertising, I'm not saying direct to consumer testing, advertising is a driver. And I think there should be some look as to how could this be done actually in a way that people feel is responsible um, in educating the patient. Because we do know that if you keep having patients showing up asking for something and they're going down the street, that is probably going to adopt much faster than almost anything I can think of. And, and that's what the pharmaceutical industry has actually learned around this. So I want to be careful that we don't call, we don't move to direct to consumer testing, but enlightenment and asking for this, you know, get your genome sequence, ask your doctor, might be a little bit too bold, but something in that direction. Yeah, and again, or a big I, advertising budget. Yeah, yeah, there's that, which I'm sure NHR would be happy to come forward with. So I think, Julie, we had you again? Yeah, I'd like to come back to um, something that Rex was talking about, which is, you know, when do physicians choose? And, and I think it really goes back to the very first discussion about evidence. I can guess some of the ones that they chose not to, and if you ask them, it would be because there's not an RCT that documents the benefit. And then you do an RCT and you get back to um, what I think Jeff brought up, which is an RCT is usually an efficacy study, not an effectiveness study. So there's this very, I think, maybe more for pharmacogenetics than the other examples, but there's this rather circular challenge I think we are in in some ways in convincing um, certain sectors of the provider community. Well, I think it also gets to the point that Mike brought up earlier, which is the idea that had that come out of the cardiology, that guideline come out of cardiology, that would be something the cardiologists would, would probably be more likely to adopt than opposed to this group that they may never have heard of before. And, and, and that, of course, then creates a real conundrum because it's probably unrealistic to expect professional societies to come up with guidelines around all of these different instances, uh, but there's usually no process, uh, although I know ISCC has been, you know, taking a little bit of a look at this, which is how might we be able to have a cross-cutting process where we could, you know, uh, have joint development. But in most cases, and, and certainly uh, ha having been on the board of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, trying to develop joint guidelines with uh, professional societies that we're aligned with, like NSGC or AAP or that, it's a real nightmare um, to deal with the administrative hurdles of doing that, what the bylaws say you can do. So, um, you know, th that, that process and whether that's something that, um, you know, uh, we know that NIH has in general been not playing in, in the guideline uh, business, although I think the ISCC is at least talking about it um, theoretically. Uh, whether that's uh, a worthy topic for research or not, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know. So, um, Mike, did you want to say something? Because I think you you had had your hand up slightly before Dan did. Yeah. Well, I mean, think that there are going to be, you know, a lot of this, these, the guidelines evolve organically, and we can we could have a whole day 
about that that whole process. But they they are they, there will be uptake of certain um, you know a actionable variants or profiles that that will find their way. And I mean, there's already are you know in in cardiology there's already already discussion about um, you know whether or not risk prediction. We heard the example in in cardiomyopathy. So I mean there is going to be uptake. It's going to be spotty and hit or miss. And I, I, I think that um, there, the, there is some utility, even though the politics of working between societies can be sometimes quite challenging and, and can be cumbersome. I really think that, that it's going to be important for um, the, the ACMG to f at least explore the possibility for engaging various specialty societies. Um, and, and, and if, if for one reason, just dissemination um, and education, but the other is, is that I, I, you know, I, you know, I envision the possibility of recommendations around the same variant being different society to society. So, you know, so, um, so I'll, in a given clinical context. Yeah. Uh, oh, totally. I mean, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're getting a little bit close to time here. I've been given a, little, a few extra minutes because the discussion has been going really well. So I've got Dan, and I've got Bill, and I've got Stephen. But be, uh, before we move off of that, I just wanted to mention something that I found out is that we were developing in ClinGen a resource landing page, and that is that NCBI actually maintains, I think it's NCBI, I don't think it's NHGRI, maintains a site of all genetic and genomic guidelines. And so there's an aggregation site that I wasn't aware of. And it seems to me that that's something, uh, we, we plop that onto our ClinGen resource page, but that, uh, the idea of having a place where we can centralize and, and use that as a dissemination vehicle would be something to probably leverage that would be a relatively low cost. So. Yes, but the problem with the gui National Guidelines Clearinghouse is, is that every guideline is in there, and while you can search them for genetic or genomic, this one is focused solely on genetic and genomic guidelines, which in this space I thought was incredibly still, useful. Still going? I thought that was dead. Uh, no, nope, it's still going. Still going, yes, yeah. having formerly worked there. Is that, who was, who's that disembodied voice? Okay. <laughs> can, I, can I add to that, um, just that in terms of collating all the uh, genetics, genomics-oriented guidelines. That's something that uh, MedGen and the Genetic Testing Registry do at NCBI. And then we've been um, working with uh, Muin Curry's group and Sherry Shelley and uh, Dave Dotson to actually do an analysis of that about what's happened over the past few years and et cetera. Yeah, that, that's what I remembered seeing. So thanks, Wendy, for clarifying that since I couldn't perfectly remember. Dan? Just a very brief comment. That, that's the, the business of, you know, who writes the guidelines and then who pays attention to the guidelines. So the, the clopidogrel guidelines from CPIC, I wanted Mary to say this, but she didn't want to say it, is, you know, include clinical pharmacology people, clinical pharmacogenomics people, and clinical cardiology people as well. And I think that's the way to do it. You engage the multiple communities to, uh, to write the guidelines, and that way the, 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 the guidelines or the document will have credibility across multiple uh, multiple constituencies. The, the, the problem, Rex has heard me say this before, the problem with implementing something like CYP2C19 and clopidogrel in your own environment is that it becomes very important, I think, to engage the interventional cardiology community. Um, and if you don't have a champion within that community at your own institution, then it's, then it's a hard slog. And if you do, then it's a much easier slog. And, and just one last point, and that is the, the point that Mike just made. We've looked very, very, very hard for an effective genotype on clopidogrel response in cerebral vascular disease. And you know, maybe it's the small numbers, maybe it's a different pathophysiology, but it's, we can't find one yet. So uh, it really is, uh, the, de the evidence is best for people with clots inside their coronary stents. And after that, the evidence is less good. And I think that's an interesting observation as well. Bill. Um, as a general internist, I will say, uh, and this is reflecting also some of the comments that we've just had, uh, I would uh, argue for actually engaging the uh, clinici various clinician societies up front before you start thinking towards planning out your next research program as opposed to making it uh, an objective to look at the barriers as part of the research program because uh, having been on the side of having people try to dictate to me uh, what I should be doing in clinic. I'm often looking for different things 
than necessarily what the recommending organizations are looking for. So actually having the conversation up front is probably uh, a useful start as opposed to sort of saving it as a research question. Yeah, I think that that's certainly been a lesson learned from the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee uh, meetings that have been ongoing, is that that's been an attempt to really get at that, and can, one can argue about how effective that's been, but at least we're trying to work in that space. Stephen, you get the last word in the discussion, then we'll sum up. Well, you're giving an Irishman the last word? <laughs> Dangerous. Um, so I think we need two types of things. Uh, for those of us who are on the inside, who are believers in genomic medicine and pioneers, guidelines are phenomenally useful because they allow us to understand what the community is thinking about and to adhere. But for those who are non-converts, non-genomic medicine pioneers, it's exactly what we've just heard. They're intrusive, they're somewhat obnoxious, they're yet more work. What the vast majority of medicine, I believe, needs uh, takes me back to when I was an intern, and that was the Timmy and Tammy trials. So we had a situation there where the treatment of an acute myocardial infarction was a piece of art. Uh, and over a period of about 15 studies and a decade, it became completely parameterized down to dosing, timing, the, uh, the set of uh, measures that would be implemented in, in series. And that's really what we need to develop, I believe, as a community for the specific use cases that we believe precision medicine or genomic medicine can deliver on today. Yeah, I think that's a, a brilliant point. And, and of course, anybody that's tried to parameterize guidelines immediately runs up to the fact that um, the people that write the guidelines aren't really that interested in being adequately explicit, that we like to use weasel words and that you may consider or, you know, perhaps should think about, uh, which doesn't, you know, lend itself to uh, developing in an algorithm. And so th that's a constant battle that I see Bob shaking his head that we've, uh, uh, that we've uh, been through. But the point is well taken that if we can create guidelines that can, in fact, be uh, computable uh, and implement them where there's uh, strong evidence that this is the right thing to do, that can be very useful. And no, Wendy, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you your last chance to go in because we need to, or no, Terry's giving you special dispensation. So, all right, then, and then I bow to, to Terry. So you lucked out. Quick. Um, well, because you talked about computable and being explicit in guidelines, I just want to support that because um, we, we spoke with um, CAP, for example, about, well, so in, in the, the uh, what we do when we find guidelines is we try to attach them to conditions to which they're relevant, genes to which they're relevant, and then that way they show up on tests and conditions and so forth. So there's some judgment involved in saying, okay, what kind of lung cancer is this for? And so we spoke with uh, CAP about, okay, well, you know, I know cancer genetics, am I really right about what I've picked out? And does it correspond to these specific um, condition unique IDs? And can we move to a place where the people that write guidelines can actually select the, um, the unique uh, CUIs that they belong to or genes, gene symbols? So they were very open to that. Um, you know, I think that this is a very new idea for uh, people that write guidelines to make them, um, you know, machine readable. But it's, it's very doable just with some effort. Right. So, so Terry is being very generous here and has allowed Jeff now to get in. So, so, uh, so sorry, uh, Stephen, we did not give an Irishman the last well, word. Well, where I thought the Irishman... That's why, we, that's why Terry's not yeah, that's Irishman. Irishman. Because Jeff is Irish and I'm not aware of it. <laughs> where I thought the Irishman was going uh, was, um, was also the Timmy, Tammy, and, and various trials like that have really strong industry sponsorship. And in order to do the kinds of studies you're talking about require resources that probably are beyond what NHGRI can afford. So it just is a plug for us to really give serious consideration about where the opportunity is to engage industry to develop the evidence along with us. Great, thank you. So uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to, because of the way I moderate, I, I asked if Terry would mind uh, taking uh, summary notes. And so um, Terry is going to do a summary, and then I'm going to quick go around to the panel members who I've also asked to uh, uh, pay attention. Again, if Terry mentions something, um, don't reiterate it. But if you, there's something that you heard uh, that isn't in Terry's summary, then we'll each have a chance to kind of fill in the gaps. Hopefully this will, will display. So I did share my screen, Rita, and it's, I assume it's coming up like really soon. Um, but even if you, if you can't see it, one, one of the things that we had, had, uh, are hoping for from this session uh, is not only um, uh, impact of, of 
sort of the, the implementation itself, but the impact of our research programs. So one of the things we need to do to, in order to justify a research program is to actually show that, you know, that it's made a difference. And so how we're going to do that would be very helpful to, uh, to know. Rita Chambers will stop sharing content as soon as you start sharing. Okay, so I hit share. Oh my God, it's working. This is great. Right. Yay, wow. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so those are, those are the kinds of things that we'd, we'd really like to hear. I'm not sure why it's quite so ugly, but um, we can go with it this way. Um, so, so we heard a lot about similar methods and common elements uh, as, as we're, uh, was done in Ignite and about the challenge of, of providing support for that. Um, and uh, really that, that NHGRI should look to ways to support and expect that common measures and, and other kinds of program-wide efforts would be implemented. Uh, it was pointed out that this is more challenging the more, the more diverse the programs are. I would argue that it's also, the more fruitful, the more diverse they are, um, because really, what you know, the genome is—we like to think of ourselves as being everything—and um, and so if we can find ways that our work is relevant all across the NIH institutes as well as all across disease and uh, organ systems, and that that's that's a plus for us. So. Um, we were uh, also encouraged to include plans to produce program-wide data and, and common efforts and the, the value of coordinating centers or somebody having that as their day job, uh, I think, was, was uh, uh, emphasized and, and is not always the case. The Insight program, for example, does not have a coordinating center. Maybe that's something that we should be, we should be looking toward to try to do. Uh, actually, Emerge started with just kind of an administrative coordinating center, and they were very proactive, as Chris pointed out, uh, and kind of grew by themselves uh, with some help from us, but, uh, but showed the value of that and, and really expanded into a, a much more active uh, uh, kind of group. Um, we were also encouraged to try to integrate with the HCSRN, which used to be HMORN, and I don't remember what it stands for, but that's all right. Um, and particularly because that group, un unlike many of ours, has payers at the table and has them involved in um, designing the kinds of research that they're doing, as I understood it. Um, and so that, that is something that we ought to, to look toward. On the other hand, I think we need to be careful. Um, you know, the, the healthcare industry, as, as much as we complain about about how much it costs, it is a, a tremendously profit-making industry here, and so I'm not, I'm not sure that we'd want NHGRI research to support more profit-making. Um, really what we, what we want is to make medical care better, and, and, and I think that's what everybody wants, even, even the payers. Um, but we do need to, to draw, so, you know, tread a fine line there in terms of what is the research that we're actually, what's the goal of the research that we're trying to do. Um, we were encouraged to measure outcomes of value to patients, payers, healthcare delivery systems, and even regulators. And, and I think uh, we're, we're not asking as much as we probably could from the regulatory systems, okay, what is the kind of evidence and information that you want? And they may not know, um, and it may be up to us to sort of say, wouldn't it be useful to you to have this kind of information uh, in order to change the way that you do regulation? But we need to think about better ways of, of getting that, those messages across. Um, and I, I uh, was, was intrigued by uh, um, uh, Mark's reminder reminding us of Reed Tuxen's comments back in May of 2012, I think it was, um, that we're, they're looking to us to transform the way we care for patients, uh, which is probably asking a little bit much. On the other hand, um, there are some very proactive ways. I mean, if you, if you um, look at some of the work that's been done in the, the, uh, the CSER program and the, the ClinSeq project here at NIH, I mean, we really are going from, uh, you know, redefining what disease is based on some of gen the genetic findings that you then go back and you find, oh my goodness, this person actually actually has been suffering from a condition for years, if not decades, and just sort of assumed that's the way it always was, especially with Mendelian variants, where there are other people in the family that that's the way it always was, and so that's just the way we are. Um, so, so something to, to keep in mind. Um, but we are in a different era, and, and particularly now, we can't compare ourselves to CAT scans and PET scans and those kinds of things. The, the standards are different now. Uh, the, the question was asked, and, and I think is one that's well worth exploring, maybe in collaboration with the IOM Roundtable. Can we design systems that will help to guide the clinician to the specific tests they should do? So that when really an, an individual gene test or even an individual variant is the test to be done, is there a way to kind of, you know, prompt them to do that rather than, than jumping immediately to a whole genome sequence? Some systems, and we could talk about this at the discussion session at the end of today, some systems actually have a gateway or a gatekeeper for whole genome sequence, and they would ask many of these questions, I think. So something else to consider um, in terms of the research we could do. 
Um, the point was made and well taken that each profession looks toward its own societies for guidelines and promoting, promoting joint development is really, really hard. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like promoting collaboration amongst uh, 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 NIH institutes in that it's you know, hard enough to do things within your own group, but then trying to do them across groups, especially where every group says, unless we're involved from day one, you know, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna sign on, uh, that can be a major problem. Um, also engaging studies, uh, societies and study designs to find out what information is useful in their guidelines. That kind of harkens back to what we said about having payers and other stakeholders at the table. Um, and then this, this question of could guidelines be computable, uh, Wendy assures us that that's not a problem as long as they're specific enough and we rely on, on groups like CPIC and others to give us specific guidelines. Great. Um, so quick uh, around the panel, a very brief, Erwin. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's a great summary, Terry. I would perhaps uh, request to add to, now it's moved on, the previous slide. You, yeah. Um, uh, measures outcome of value. Health care delivery systems and providers are not always aligned. Mm -hmm. And I would add here provider as a separate entity to deal with uh, in the value proposition. Thank you, Erwin. Warwick. Well, at the same point, uh, measure outcomes, ask them first what they think might be, might be useful outcomes. Thank you. And Ruth. I agree with all of that. Okay, great. Uh, the only thing, I, I, I heard a concept that Jeff um, used that I thought was great. I'm not sure exactly what all would it be entail it, but I love the idea of an implementation commons. And I just think that that really sounds, it sounds great. And if we can actually create something that's as good as it sounds, I think it would be really cool. Uh, but I, that, was, that was something that really uh, was sticky for me. So with that, thank you all very much for, I think, a very productive discussion. And thanks to my panel members for all their help.